Welcome to today's webinar series, um, BIM Model QAQC Tools and Overview. This is part of the Year of the Deliverable series that Autodesk, CAD Microsystems, and the Campus FM Technology Association have been collaborating to provide you. This is the second webinar in the series, but the overall series will conclude and will continue with pre-conference sessions as well as conference sessions at the annual CFDA conference. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So who's talking to you today? If we take a look at who's going to be actually our presenters today, my name is Chuck Meese. I'm a senior manager on the business development team at Autodesk. Uh, I like to refer to myself as a recovering architect. Uh, been around the CFTA since 2008 uh, and about 33 years of experience in architecture and facilities. I'm going to be joined today by TJ Meehan. So TJ, I'll let you uh, uh, introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm TJ Meehan. I'm the Vice President of Technology Solutions at CAD Microsystems. Um, we work closely with Autodesk developing these tools for owners. Um, I have a lot of passion around BIM and Kobe and FM. So hopefully that will come through today on presenting. Great. So what are we going to talk to you about today? TJ, if we can go to the next slide. Today is really going to be about this. Uh, we're going to talk to you about our BIM interoperability tools. We're also going to talk to you about some things that are coming in the future. So unfortunately, being part of a publicly traded software company, I need to give you a safe harbor statement that basically says we're going to talk to you about some things that are coming up in the future. Uh, please don't make your decisions based on the futures, and we have no obligation to update our future forward-looking statements. So I'll let you all have just a little bit of time to look at our safe harbor statement. So TJ, let's go ahead and continue then. So as we mentioned, this is part of the Year of the Deliverables event series focused on that singular topic of BIM deliverables. The first webinar was held on Tuesday, June 5th, and that was really about BIM requirements. Why do you need to have them? For those of you who weren't able to see that, the web webcast was recorded and posted to the CFTA YouTube channel. The link is right there on the screen. Similarly, we will be recording today's webcast, which is about the Model QC tools. And then that will lead into two pre-conference sessions on Tuesday, July 31st. BIM requirements, why you need to have them, a deeper dive, and then a deeper dive on the tools that we're going to give you an overview today. And then that will ultimately conclude with a conference session uh, about the QAQC tools where TJ will present along with our partners from Ohio State University and Western Michigan University, talk about how they're using the tools to ensure they're getting good deliverables. So TJ, if we can move to the next slide. So what are our learning objectives for today? So over the next 30 minutes, here's what we plan to cover. We plan to help you understand what are some of the issues related to BIM standards and interoperability. We can help you understand how to resolve these issues using defining a workflow we call classify, validate, and deliver. We'll talk about the interoperability tools, um, and I'll give you the first introduction to the tools now. The BIM interoperability tools are a set of free utilities that Autodesk has actually developed and placed into the public domain for it to be used by people in trying to achieve and look at BIM deliverable guidelines. And then uh, TJ and I are very passionate about attending the CFDA conference, and we'll give you some reasons why you should do that. So it really starts with opportunity. And the opportunity is all based around the idea of the issues that TJ and I have heard so many times when talking to owners about BIM standards and interoperability. And it's really about the quality of the data that they're getting through the deliverable process. It's really about helping the entire team understand what the model standards are. And then it's about the last piece, which is what we'll focus most of the time on today, is this idea of how do we validate and resolve issues that may come up through the deliverable process, right? So how do we make sure we're getting high quality? How do we make sure everybody's on the same page? And then most importantly, how do we check and resolve any issues that might come up? To deal with this, at Autodesk and CAD Microsystems, we've developed approach. And this approach is, is based on three tenets. The first tenet is the idea of classifying information. So in other words, making sure that the information that we're inputting into the model through the model-based process 
is properly classified and structured. If we can do that at the beginning of the process, we can then head off issues that might happen later in the process. And we have a tool that works specifically to that that TJ will introduce to you today. The second component in the workflow and the approach is validate. So if we've classified and we've entered information in appropriately, how do we then validate that that information has been um, entered appropriately with model checking, model validation tools, but also doing so in a workflow that is, is much more um, integrated so it allows you to understand challenges you may have instead of what I like to refer to as a punitive workflow where I deliver my model to the owner and the model the owner comes back and says no your model doesn't meet our standards and now I'm being punished and we have to go back and forth and then that of course leads into the third component of the approach which is all about delivering the information so again think of the approach that we're taking with BIM interoperability around classify validate and then deliver and how do we do that? We do that with the interoperability tools. So TJ, I'm going to turn that over to you now and let you talk about the interoperability tools and how people can use these tools to meet their needs. All right. Thanks, Chuck. So these tools are free to everybody. Um, they're available from this website, the BIM interoperabilitytools.com website. Um, you can download them, install them on Revit. They're free to everybody. Um, there's no licensing or anything like that. Uh, and the reason we actually showed the safe harbor slide today is because um, those of you who have used these tools in the past ha are familiar with them, and, and they are going through a big update. Um, one that is one that is going to be uh, rolled out here in the next week or so. So um, we're going to show you the new versions of all these tools today. Those of you who have used them before, those of you who haven't, it'll all be new. Um, but you, you will definitely see what they're used for. So let's start, let's jump into some of these tools. You can see that the website has six tools. We're going to focus on three of these today. We're going to do an overview of those tools. Um, the first is the classification manager, essentially the top row. Second is the model checker and the model checker configurator. So what is the classification manager? Um, this is a tool that allows you to classify your elements in a model. Generally, people do this with standardized classification systems. So that might be uniformat, master format, omniclass, table 21, 22, 23, whatever. If you're um, overseas, it might be the, uh, uh, the uniclass uh, tables that they use to classify elements. All of that is available in the, in the classification manager and allows you to easily assign it to your elements. Not only that, it'll allow you to assign multiple classification systems. So if I pick a uniclass number, uh, sorry, a uniformat number, it'll automatically apply a master format, a table 21, and a table 22 number that are equivalent um, if those exist. So um, the big part with Classification Manager and the reason that so many people use it is because it's all based on Excel spreadsheets. So you can have not only those default classification systems that come with the software, but you can build your own very quickly. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of that today. On the model checker side, um, this is how you can review your model and validate that um, what's in it is what you've asked for. So the model checker is a great way to look through a model and see, um, did somebody actually add the, the parameters, the, the data fields that I was expecting? Did they put data in them? Are they formatted a certain way? Did somebody actually model what I asked them to model, like ceilings or mechanical equipment. So the, the model checker is a great way to be able to check your model for this. Um, it comes with many uh, uh, sample check sets that you can use to check your models against, but it also comes with a model checker configurator that allows you to build your own checks. I'll show you both of these today and how simple they are to use. Um, some other tools that are on the website that we're not going to touch on today is the it, Enhanced CWG Exporter. Obviously, Revit allows you to export to DWG files. There are some limitations there, in particular with layering, um, and also with things like exporting what looks like an annotation symbol just to lines and text instead of a block with attributes. And this can actually help you with that. So I uh, encourage you to, to download that and try it out. The other tool we're not going to talk about today on the, on the deliver end is the Kobe extension. Um, 
COBE extension if you're asking for COBE data. If you need operations and maintenance data from your models, this is the best way to do that. Let's dive in, though, to these three tools today, Classification Manager, Model Checker, Model Checker Configurator. I'm going to go right into Revit, and let's get started. So I have the sample model open up. Before you get too deep into the workflow, I failed to mention that we have the QA pen pane for people to ask questions. Uh, so while you're going through all of this, if, if people have questions, feel free to type those into the QA pane, and then we'll get to that. So sorry about that, TG. I, I forgot to mention that. No problem. We lost you there for a little bit. You, uh, uh, you okay? Sound is good now? Yes. Okay. So I have the sample model, uh, a smaller model to make it easier. Um, I want to show you the classification manager first. And let's do an example of this. Let's say, for example, um, I have uh, on the first floor plan here just a bunch of doors. I'm just going to select everything. I'm going to go over and, and filter out my view. I'm just going to say, you know what, select all the doors. Let's say I want to assign a uniform at number to these doors altogether. Now, they're all different types of doors. So it doesn't let me edit the type here because of the different types of doors. but the classification manager will let me do that. So I'm going to be working on this tab, BIM Interoperability Tools. Again, for those of you who um, have used these tools before, they have their own tab now. They're not on the add-ins tab anymore. Um, if I go to hit Setup, you're going to see a whole new interface, by the way, for those of you who have used them before. And you'll see things like our public libraries. So we have a bunch of databases available to the public, the US database, the UK database, um, the FICOM database, which I'll talk about here in a second. So I can load in my database here, and then that way when I go to assign it to doors, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of load in that Excel file. That Excel file is um, both on the web and in the install folder so that uh, if you're not connected to the web, you can still use this. The first time I go to assign, it has to load up all the tables and, you know, you know, format, master format. There's thousands and thousands of entries. But once it loads it in, um, then I'm ready to just click and go. And so then it will bring up a list for me to utilize in here. So you can see now that um, it has recognized that I've selected on some elements, so it wants me to assign elements. Of course, I could assign to a facility. Um, if I had selected some spaces or rooms or areas, it would give me that. Uh, if I'm using the Kobe extension, I can assign classifications to the contacts for it. I can filter through this and say, you know what, only show me what applies to doors. And of course, I'm looking at the Uniformat tab, but I could have Master Format, Omniclass Table 21, 22, 23. And um, now you can have actually unlimited tabs in here. It used to be limited to five. When I go look at the, maybe assign my interior swinging doors, I can assign that. I'm just going to assign it to uh, overwrite whatever's there. And very quickly, just by selecting a couple clicks, I can assign that to all of those doors. All 45 doors have been assigned. What you'll notice is that this stays open now. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a non-modal dialog box, meaning I can have this open and continue to select items and make changes to them without even having to close this dialog box. Let me assign the classification to this. Let me assign the classification to that, and so on. Of course, it's done that. If I go look at it, you'll see now that it not only assigns my uniformat number, which was interior swinging doors of C1030.10, .10, but it said, hey, there's an equivalent master format of 81000 interior swinging doors, and so, uh, or doors and frames. So that's where it kind of crosses and uses this assigned similar classification to uh, load it in for multiple databases, so depending on what you're using it for. So I did this for doors. If I don't select anything and I hit assign, then it says, well, obviously you want to assign this to the facility. So the building as a whole, and it has Omniclass Table 11 built into the US database. If I instead select a bunch of items, I'm not even going to filter it, and I go to assign, it says, well, you could assign it to the facility. You could assign it to the space or the elements. I did elements before, but now it'll let me even do the spaces. 
in here. And of course, this is OmniClass Table 13, um, which it uses for spaces. But now we have available, I can just go into Setup and look in my public library down here, and I can find the FICOM database. I'll just load that in. I'll grab my pieces. I'll go to Assign. It recognizes that the FICOM database doesn't actually have any elements in it, so it's just showing me the space. And now I could go through and say that these are just a bunch of um, offices, let's say, and assign that. They've been assigned. It flashes up to tell me they're assigned. I can close this. I can keep it open. I can keep going. Um, but now if I go look at that, let's see over here, that 310 office has been assigned as the classification number and description for it. Very easy to do. I know a lot of you are using, uh, you know, FICOM codes to uh, classify your spaces. So this is free and out of the box and ready for you to use for it. I'm going to come back to the uh, classification manager in a little bit. I want to jump up to the model checker, talk about how we can use that. Let me switch back to my 3D view. So I'm going to go to launch the model checker in here, and I'm going to open a checkset file. I had one already, but I'm going to open a different checkset file. You notice our public library has a bunch of them available, and we're continuing to add to this all the time. Um, and you'll notice that many organizations like your own are, are in here, Ohio State, Western Michigan, State of Tennessee, Penn State, Army Corps of Engineers, and so on. Um, you can use those and, and build your own off of them. I'm going to do just a, the generic one that we put out here, this checks by family category. And you see what it does is it, it lists all the different family categories in Revit whether they're air terminals or conduits or doors. Some of them it breaks up into, in this case, exterior doors, interior doors. And this check is going to look and see did were there actually exterior doors modeled. Do they have fire ratings? Do they have a unique identifier? So on. You can control all of this. And you can say, you know what, look for that or don't look for that. It's, it's up to you. I'm just going to save and close this. I'm going to go and, and actually run it. So you can see what kind of report I'm going to get. So when I go to run the model checks, you'll notice that it lists the model I've opened, but I can add other models. So I can batch this. I could add as many models as I want. I can even have it look in their linked files. So if they have links within them, it'll automatically look in there. I'm just going to run it on the current model. So this is going to go through and actually look at over 300 different checks within this model. Think about how long it would take you to go and look at over 300 checks in a model, um, hours or even days. This is going to do it in about 25 seconds for this model. It's not a big model, but even very large models might be two minutes to do this. And what it's going to do is it's going to come back and give me a report on exactly what happened. Those of you who've used it in the past, you'll see a, a much cleaner and easier to read report than we had before. So I got a pass of 93%. So what happened is it looked at 300 different 301 different things, different checks. 279 of them passed, which is the 93%, and 22 failed. And as I scroll down, you see for the different categories, it gives me that counts of pass-fail for each of those categories. So let's do an example here. On the exterior doors, it came back and said, you know what, there are exterior doors placed, and they do all have a fire rating assigned to them, and a mark, and a tight mark, and so on. If I look at some of the failed ones, conduit fittings, let's say, there aren't actually any conduit fittings in this model. They weren't placed in there, and that's why I failed. Um, of course, this is an architectural model. I probably wouldn't even want to check that box to look for it. But you get the idea. It's, it's very good at going through and saying, well, there is no assembly code assigned, or, you know, pipes in here. It looks like, yep, pipes were placed, sanitary and vent pipes were placed for sanitary systems but they didn't actually give it a, um, an assembly code, which is the uniform at our Omniclass number. This report, um, you see, can be copied to your clipboard, so I could paste it into a Word document or somewhere else. I can export it to HTML um, and maybe you know, throw it in my project folder. Um, and now, new, you can actually export it to Excel. So those of you who are tracking these reports over time, let's say every submission, you can use those Excel files to, to plug into um, some sort of analytics software, maybe Tableau or Power BI, and see trends over time of what's changed with your models. Um, and that's a new feature that we're adding in here. 
if I close out of here, um, I can go back and view that report at any time. So this report actually stays with the model. The model checker makes no changes to a model. It will not modify anything in your model. It just looks at it and reports what it finds. But this report can stay with the model. So if I actually now save the model and send it to somebody, they can just open up the model and say, view last report and see what happened. So think of a workflow from an owner's perspective to say, hey, as part of our deliverables, every time you deliver a model, just run the model checker on it um, with our custom check set for it and make sure that it passes. And we're just going to open up the model and see that you did that and see that it passed. And we might spot check some of those things. But that takes the onus off the owner of having to go through and check everything. And it makes it easier for your, your model authoring teams, your designers and, and, and engineers and contractors to be able to check models before they submit into you so we're not having to do this back and forth. Let's make a change. TJ, one of the things we've heard fairly consistently from our customers using the model checkers, they run it continuously, right? They're constantly validating where they add against a particular check set. So it's not this one and done. I don't get to the end. I don't run it and go, oh, man, I got a thousand errors to fix, right? You might start running it early in design, and then you just continue to refine. Yeah, I would say, too, that most owners have what they have is their publicly available um, check set file, and that um, corresponds directly with their published BIM requirements. But then they also have internal check sets that they're using all the time to run on things that are more targeted to say, well, I just finished schematic. Let me run this one to see what's happening with that. So let's break it. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to pick on this exterior door, and I'm going to look at the properties of the type, right? So. This door actually has a fire rating assigned to it of just one. Let's delete that. Let's make it blank. And I'm just going to simply run that same check set again to see what happens. And of course, what you would expect and what is going to happen is it's going to come up and say, well, exterior doors have now failed that check. They now do not all have a fire rating. Keep in mind that I changed the type property. So even though I picked on that one door, that was a type property. So all doors of that type now no longer have a fire rating. So it's not just going to come back with one fail. It could potentially come back with multiple fails. So let's scroll down here. Let me expand this. Let me scroll down to my exterior doors. You'll see now that the exterior doors do not have a 100% pass. They have an 83% because, as we suspect, the fire rating failed. And here's that door type that failed. So as a reviewer, as somebody who just got a model that has a fail in it, what do I do? Well, I just pick on the little show me button and have it zoom right to it and have it say that's what failed right there so that I can go fix it. How easy is that? So now I don't even have to close this report. I can just keep it open and keep jumping to where the problems are and actually pick on them and edit them right in place to fix the problem. Oh, I'm missing a fire rating? Let me type it in here. This will be one fantastic hour of fire rating for this door. How about that? I'm in a good mood today, so that's how I'm gonna name it. So I'm purposely doing that. I'm purposely doing that because do you really want people to call it one fantastic hour or one glorious hour or one miserable hour, depending on their mood? Of course not. You want a standardized list of all this stuff. You know, if I want to do a report of all the fire ratings, I don't want 12 different ways of seeing one hour. I don't want one HR, one hour capitalized, one hour lowercase. That's where the classification manager has another role. So I just, I'm going to jump back to classification manager and show you how I would deal with that. So instead of letting people type in whatever you want, um, Revit doesn't have out of the box a way to essentially give people a list of values to choose. And of course, I wouldn't have one fantastic hour as one of those values. Instead, what I can do is actually build my own uh, databases in Classification Manager. And I've built one here. I'm just going to browse to it. I built this one. 
over here a while ago, back 2016. And I'm going to apply that. And what happens now is I'm going to pick on the store and even maybe the wall that it's in and maybe even this store that's with it. It doesn't matter. I can pick all these different elements. There's no way I can edit the types all at the same time except through the classification manager. Now when I go to assign, I have a fire ratings database in there. Now I have a list of what I have as acceptable values for fire ratings. And it doesn't matter they have doors and walls. I'll pick one hour. I'll say ignore the, I want, I'm not going to say blanks only. So this way it overwrites what else people had written. So if somebody wrote one fantastic hour, it's going to overwrite it with what this is. And I will assign that. And it will come back and give me my flashing blue assigned. Um, and if I go back and pick on that door and look at its type, you will see now that one hour fire rated construction. I have a standardized list, upper, lowercase, uh, spaces, exactly the way I want people to do it. So the classification manager is a great way to not only check models, but to use it to help um, assign data to these models in a standardized way. So what if I want to build my own checks? How would I go about that? Well, that's pretty easy. That's why we have the configurator. So the configurator is actually a standalone application. This is to build your own checks. I can get to it through Revit. I don't even have to have Revit. It just installs in Windows. And I can go in here and I can launch my configurator. And you see it started with a blank one. And as before, you can now in the configurator open up some publicly available ones. We have all these sample ones that are in here. And they kind of tell you what they do and checks for interior wall types. Um, and we're going to continue to add more and more to these. What I'm going to do is just make my own. I'm just going to call it my checks. Right? The author is me, of course. Um, I could even assign it an image. Let's say I grab um, you probably noticed before that there were uh, images in the online ones. And the same thing, so you can actually have your own image um, posted in it if you want it. So now this has been totally revamped. So if you've used it in the past, it's different. So there's a couple ways to deal with this. There's the advanced check builder. So if you're a pro with this thing and you want some real high-end checks that are really digging in, you can use the advanced builder. Most people aren't gonna do that. Most people are gonna do one of two things. They're gonna use the wizard, which just asked me some questions, or they're gonna use the pre-built checks. So if I go down here to pre-built checks, maybe I wanna find out, um, for example, let's see, unused elements. So, you know, tell me everything that can be purged in there. So I'll go configure that. I could change the name on it. I'm just gonna add it to my list, just like that. Check's been added. And so brings me back to the pre-built. I can grab any of these and we continue to add to this list of pre-built. This list is about three times longer than it was in the previous version. What a lot of people will do is they'll do the wizard. So the wizard just starts to ask me some questions to build my check. Um, so let me do that fire rating check again. So this is what I wanna do. This check will fail if it finds matching elements. In other words, I wanna find everything that doesn't have a fire rating assigned. Because if they don't have a fire rating assigned, they need to fail. They failed, they have to have a fire rate. So I'm gonna pick on that. And then it says, what are you looking for? I'm looking for modeled elements versus annotative or datum elements or views. Um, so I'm gonna say modeled elements. And in this case, I'll look for architectural elements. Instead of MEP or structural in this case. And then it says, well, here are the architectural elements. What do you want? I could look for doors or even walls. I can do more than one, um, doesn't matter. And then it says, do I want to filter that more? Or am I just looking to see if they're actually modeled, placed in there? Did somebody actually model walls and doors? Well, I'm assuming they're modeled. I want to see if the fire rating is set. So give me a filter that says everything that includes this. And I'm going to look for a parameter. And there's all kinds of things that I can look for. In this case, I'm going to look for a parameter called fire rating that is empty. Find all the doors and walls where the fire rating is empty. And you can see I can have all kinds of Booleans and matching in here. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, I'm done. I don't want to filter it any more than that. You know, in other words, find only interior doors with fire ratings. But I'm not going to do that. So this is my fire ratings check. 
finds all elements without a fire rating assigned. And then, you know, you failed if it fails, let's say. And I'll finish that. So that's done and brings me back to the beginning of the wizard. So what's happening now is that it's actually building, I have this structure tab. So I've built these checks in here and I can go back and edit the checks or duplicate them or delete them. And it's just built my library of checks. And then I can come in and, and organize them. So I'll add a header. A header is just my checks. And I'll add a section in there. Maybe this section is all about fire. And then I'll add another section in there. And maybe this section is all about purge or whatever I want to call it. Right, easy enough. And then I just take these checks and I just drag them and drop them to where I want them. I want them organized like that. And these can be moved around. You can actually highlight, you can click on them and drag them around to reorganize them. Very simple to do. So I'm going to save this. It's going to prompt me where I want to put it. My checks one is good. Let me throw it on my, maybe on my uh, desktop here. Okay, I'm ready to use it. So I go into my model checker, I go to setup. I'm gonna open my new one, I'm gonna browse, go to my desktop, on my, my checks one, just like that, hit okay. You can see it's my checks, fire checks, purge checks, and then I will run it. And notice how little I needed to know about Revit to do all of this. Right? So everything passed in this case. Um, very simple to do. Easy to kind of just use the logic and walk through it and build what you need to do. So that's an overview of our three tools here, Classification Manager, Model Checker, and the Model Checker Configurator. If you come to the CFTA conference, we're going to do a deep dive of these things. Certainly we'll do the overview like we did today, but let's dig in and really understand how they work and see what the files are and how you can edit them. And um, you guys will learn a lot in that 90 minute session. Okay, I was gonna open it up to questions. Yeah, Chuck, I've, if you I've, wanna... got some, I've got some questions. So TJ, the first one is how do I get the tools? Um... So all the tools are found on the website. Let me. Open up the website here really quick. It is BIM interoperabilitytools.com. Hard to say fast, but um, easy to remember. So I go to the BIM interoperability tools website and click on classification manager, and then I can see features about it. I can download it for whatever version of Revit I have. And it looks, so we're supporting the Autodesk methodology of current release and three releases back. Correct. If you have something older, just email us through the website. We might be able to accommodate you. And so TJ, that uh, dovetails into one of the follow-on questions. So I see there's four versions of the classification manager. Does that mean each version has its own database or are the databases I build consistent across? You just showed us how to build a how to build a classification or a custom classification database. Do I need to build one for each version? That's the question I'm asking. Um, answer is no. So I, I didn't get to show you how to build that database. So it is simple. It's in Excel, and we give you a template, and you just fill out the fields. But that same Excel file will work for any version of the tool on any version of Revit, and that is the same for all of our support files. So whether I build check sets. Um, whether I build classification manager databases, they work for all tools, all versions. So if I'm an owner and I have a set of owner's requirements against which I've built a check, it doesn't matter if the firm is using 15 or 16, 17, 18, or 19, they'll be able to use my check set to validate that model. That is correct. And in fact, the website even has those owner check sets that you can download right from here if you want to, along with sample Revit models if you want to download it and try it, the one I've been showing you today. Um, the other thing I should point out that's um, very important is that we have an entire YouTube channel for these video for all the products. So here's the model checker. So there are seven 
um, YouTube videos all about two minutes each on, on how to use them. And there's an entire uh, YouTube channel for all the different tools to help you learn how to use these different, these different ones as playlists. Yeah, and, and we're getting a tremendous amount of traffic on this YouTube channel, folks. So people are really starting to hit it. So um, I, what are we, TJ, 150,000 views or something like that? It's kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it was 110,000 minutes of viewing, okay. um, which is like three years or some ridiculous number. So we've talked about how do I get the tools. Um, we've talked about the databases being the same. How can an owner or firm distribute a database to someone? So let's say, for instance, I'm an owner and I create a database that I want people to use. Let's say it's a classification manager database or a model checker database. How can I distribute that to people? So a couple different ways. You can post it on your website so that people can go download it. Um, ideally, what you, we'd want is for you to hand it over to us and we would put it in this public library. And that way, anybody who has the software installed would see that database. And they wouldn't have to reinstall the software. As soon as we add to this public library, it shows up the next time somebody launches the software. So TJ, building on that, um, the, an interesting question has come in. How do these interoperability tools work for non-federated BIM models? OK. Um, I want to understand. A a little bit more about what they mean by non-federated BIM models. I guess that, you know, generally a federated BIM model would be something that is viewed in Navisworks um, and pulled together from different file types. These are certainly um, Revit tools right now. They work within Revit um, and they review the models. The model checker does look at links. I showed you that. The classification manager can't edit data through a link because Revit doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, but you'd have to open up each model to use classification manager, but certainly the model checker can look at a model and all its links. So if you had a federated Revit model, um, you could just do one report on the whole thing and it would let you know. Okay, so to, to recap, we are Revit specific in this particular workflow. We can work through linked models for the model checker. We can't, however, work through linked models for the classification manager because of a built-in limit and Revit's ability to allow you to edit in a link. Did I su summate that correctly? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, TJ, and, and say no. Uh, you know I'm a huge fan of the classification manager and the database structure. Is it possible for you to open the XLS file that you created for fire ratings to show how simple it is to create a classification manager database? Sure. It's easy enough. Let me. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this is, you know, my time in practice, we constantly struggled in the firm to get people to label things correctly, right? The example that I always use is a storage yep. room where one person says storage and next person says STOR, the next person says STOR, period, and then the fourth writes closet, right? And when you get into the digital world, those are four different rooms. So here's the file. This is what it looks like. Um, you see there's a fire ratings tab. All of the data that is shaded comes right in the template. So all you're filling out is really this stuff right here, the stuff in yellow, if you will, is all, is all I had to fill out to make that, that database. It seems pretty simple just looking at it. You know, it's not difficult to figure out. I put in uh, my title, my description, give it a version number, tell it what parameters to assign the data to for both number and description, and then I just put in the values that I want. And if you want to have a tree view, so you wanted kind of sub-values, you could use the level button to say, well, put this underneath that, or this one underneath that one. Um, and that's a structure that, that Revit uses natively in its out-of-the-box files. So that's that's how simple it is. Um, you know, I started and, to build one for wall types and. On the instructions tab, we give everybody all of the, the instructions they need to actually create one of these databases, including the Revit family category codes and all of that good stuff. Yep. Great. 
Great. Yeah, and that category code is just for filtering. You don't need to use that. Um, you can simplify it down to this. In this case, I didn't use category codes because it could work for multiple different types of elements. Yeah. And just for, for everybody out there, I, mean, I, I know talking to all of the higher ed owners, one of the issues that you, you struggle with is getting rooms named based on your room naming parameters. Um, it would be easy to set up a classification manager database uh, and give it to your firms and say, you can only name rooms using these names, so. So TJ, there's there's one more question in the, in the QA box. I think it might help if you can see that and read it. Sure. Does the BIM model author have to grant permission to allow changes for the MEP civil or fire protection sub consultants or general contractors to make changes to the BIM model? Well, right now, um, the, there really isn't uh, security on on that. So, you know, this, frankly, this question doesn't really have to do with these tools. Um, these tools work on any model, no matter who opens the model. Uh, but, you know, they're, right now, the way you handle that of, of dealing with people editing models or not editing models is by using something like BIM 360 to host them and control your permissions that way. Okay. Great, great answer. So we, we actually have, we tried to do 40 minutes. I think we're about three minutes long. We don't have any more questions in the QAQC panel. Um, so here is our passionate plea for the CFTA conference. Um, I've been involved in every conference since 2008. Uh, I find the CFTA conference to be one of the things I, I look forward to most every year. Um, and it's really because of two things. The first one is all of the sessions and all of the learning that will happen there. And there's a lot of quality topics that are going to be presented on this year if you look at the agenda. The second one is the networking. I learn so much at each CFTA conference by having the opportunity to sit down and talk to uh, you and 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 talk to peers and share information and um, uh, last time we spoke to Michelle the attendance this year is looking quite good so there's going to be someone there who may have figured out something that you're struggling with and having the opportunity to set with them at lunch or whatever is is just spectacular um, so again the CFTA annual conference is Tuesday July 31st through August 3rd being hosted by our friends at the Ohio State University um, the pre-conference sessions are happening on Tuesday July 31st as we mentioned we will be doing two pre-conference sessions one to go more deeply into BIM deliverables which was the subject of our first webcast and the second pre-conference session will be to go more deeply into these specific tools there is the link cfta.org to learn more about the conference. And with that, TJ, I'll leave it for you for any final thoughts, and then we'll close up. Yeah, here's the here's the website in case anybody um, needs it. And then um, biminteroperabilitytools.com. And then here's our contact information. So if you have questions uh, from today or want to learn more about any of this stuff or even learn more about this whole process of models and BIM and how it's going to help you, please reach out to either one of us. We'd be happy to um, discuss it in more detail with you. Great. TJ, thank you. And thank you all for attending today. We look forward to seeing you in Columbus. All right. Thank you, everybody.